Australia is truly a sunburnt country. While this has meant greater melanoma rates and farmers struggling with drought, it also means we could become a nation powered by sunshine. In fact, we could power the entire country using less than 1% of its surface area with the latest in solar technology. And helping us reach this goal is Dr. Kylie Catchpole, an ARC Research Fellow from the Centre for Sustainable Energy Systems at the Australian National University. Dr. Catchpole and her team have recently developed a new, more efficient solar cell using silver nanoparticles. This invention was named by MIT in 2010 as one of the world's 10 most important emerging technologies and saw Dr. Catchpole win the ABC's New Inventors program in May this year. I recently caught up with Dr. Catchpole to hear more about this fabulous new invention. So Kylie, you've helped invent a more efficient solar cell, which MIT named one of the top 10 research projects most likely to change the world. Uh, can you explain how this more efficient solar cell works for us, please? Yes, so what we do is we put tiny metal particles on top of solar cells and they, the electrons inside the tiny metal particles oscillate, they go back and forth and then they scatter the light inside the solar cell. So the light bounces back, back and forth inside the solar cell so it has more chance of being absorbed. That's fantastic. And what is this uh, called, this process? It's called plasmonic light trapping. Awesome. And does this uh, work with any type of solar cell or is it a special type of solar cell we need to use this new technology? That's one of the advantages of the plasmonic light trapping technology. It works with any type of solar cell and we put the metal particles onto the solar cell near the end of the solar cell process so it's compatible with nearly any solar cell process. Wow, and how much more efficient does this uh, plasmonic light trapping make the solar cell? By putting the metal particles on top of the solar cell, we can get 20% more efficiency um, compared to a solar cell that doesn't have the particles. That's cool. And do you think that that could even improve further into the future? Yes, we're working on a project funded by the Australian Solar Institute uh, to increase the efficiency further and to try and develop this process towards commercialisation. Oh, cool. And uh, how do we do that process? If we've made the solar cell, uh, how do you then add these metal particles to increase the efficiency? What we do is we evaporate a very thin layer of metal all over the surface of the solar cell. Uh, it's a very thin layer and so that doesn't add very much at all to the cost of the solar cell. And then we just put it in a normal oven at about 200 degrees C, similar to the temperature of your standard domestic oven. And the metal balls up into tiny particles on the surface of the solar cell. And does it have to be a particular type of metal? Uh, yes, we use uh, silver, but it would also be possible to use copper. Oh, cool. So this is a type of nanotechnology that they're using to apply to solar technology. Why are we moving towards making solar cells thinner and thinner and smaller and smaller? One of the main costs in a solar cell is the cost of the silicon material. So silicon is a very abundant material. It's the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust, so we have plenty of it but it is expensive to purify the silicon uh, and to make it into silicon wafers for a solar cell. The thin, thin film solar cells can use a hundred times less silicon than a standard silicon solar cell, but of course they absorb less light because they're thinner. So what we're doing is regaining that light by making light bounce back and forth inside the solar cell so that it can be absorbed. That's fantastic. So do you think with this uh, cheaper and more efficient uh, solar cell technology, that solar will become a real player in our energy future? Absolutely. Solar cells are growing exponentially. The photovoltaic market has been growing at a rate of about 50% per year over the last 10 years. Just in last year alone, the, the photovoltaic industry doubled in size. So it's growing very dramatically and as it's growing, costs are falling. So. In fact, in most areas of Australia now, the price of electricity from solar cells is similar to the price of standard retail electricity. Wow, so how long do you think it will be before Australia can use solar as sort of a, a large proportion of our energy needs? How far do you think we can take it? Do you think one day Australia could power our whole nation on solar energy? Uh, if we wanted to, certainly. Uh, it, we could produce all of Australia's electricity using less than 1% of the land area, so the resource is absolutely there.
Wow, do you think we will do it? Do you think there's the, there's the will and the need for us to head in that direction? I think in the long term, solar is the, the world's largest energy resource, so we'd be crazy not to use it. Mm. Where does Australia sit in this current world solar market and where do you think we should be pushing in the future in the international solar energy market? Mm -hmm. Australia has enormous energy resources and we've known for a long time that we have enormous fossil fuel resources but we need to start seeing ourselves as a renewable energy resource superpower as well. So we need to be capturing that energy and exporting it either through uh, a grid, for example, through Southeast Asia or through energy intensive products, capturing the energy of the sun and putting them into energy intensive products. That's great. Um, so you've obviously been engaged with the media to promote the plasmonic light trap. You actually, uh, earlier this year, won the new inventors on the ABC. Do you think scientists need to spend more time communicating their research to the public? I think uh, scientists do need to spend time communicating their research to the, to the public. It's important that they uh, communicate the possibilities of science, what science can do for society as well as to communicate to the next generation of scientists just how exciting research in science is. That's fantastic. So you have a physics degree uh, from ANU and a PhD in solar vo photovoltaic technology. What motivated you to study physics uh, when you're in high school? What made you choose this path and then uh, move on into solar technology? Well, I was always interested in how the universe works, essentially. At one point I wanted to be an astronomer and then a particle physicist. I was really interested in fundamentally uh, how things work and so I decided to pursue a physics degree. At the same time, I was always interested in environmental issues and I wanted to do something to help the environment, but I didn't see any connection at that point between the, uh, those two desires. So when I found the area of solar cell uh, energy research, it was a perfect combination for me. That's fantastic. I love that you found that um, great combination for you. And so what opportunities has science provided you with? Mostly it's provided me with the opportunities to work with some really great people uh, on some very exciting ideas. And of course also to travel around the world and um, talk about these ideas to other people. What do you think are the greatest global issues our society currently faces and do you think science is capable of solving them? What part do you think science would play? I think the greatest global issues are climate change and loss of biodiversity in particular. I think science has a really big role in understanding the impacts of these changes and communicating those impacts as well as mitigating those impacts. But it's not only about science. There's really uh, large roles for the political and economical sides as well. What misconceptions do you think the general public has about science that you'd like to see addressed? I think the greatest misconception is that science proceeds by a series of breakthroughs. So science proceeds by a series of developments and we're always making progress but people are always saying what's the, what's the next big breakthrough. In fact everything is built on everything else so all these ideas are built on other ideas and that's why science is in fact so successful. And what is it like being a researcher in day-to-day -day life? Um, what does your job involve day-to-day? Day-to-day I uh, talk with my students, um, suggest ideas to them, uh, listen to their ideas and, and have discussions. Um, I do calculations, I do uh, reading other people's papers, do budgets, I'm not so fun, fond of that side of things. <laughs> um, but I, overall it's a very exciting career. That's fantastic. And where do you think Australian science uh, should be heading? Is there sort of some key areas that you think Australia has really got right in science and we should be pursuing? I think in Australia we have uh, historically had a strong emphasis on supporting the areas of science that um, are associated with, with current industries in Australia and there's certainly um, a large 
place for that. This is the sort of work that the CSIRO does. But I think we need to increase the emphasis on what Australia is going to be doing in the future and what are going to be the uh, important future areas for Australia. Cool. Thank you very much. That's uh, been very interesting chatting to you, Kylie. Thanks a lot and best of luck with uh, this new solar cell technology. Thank you. So how do you make the, uh, the solar cells that you use? Do you buy them or do you uh, just start from scratch? What we start off with is a silicon wafer. So it's a thin layer of silicon, uh, about a third of a millimetre thick. Uh, and then we put it into a furnace uh, like this one. And this furnace has uh, phosphorus gas in it. And that diffuses a thin layer of phosphorus onto the surface. And that creates a PN junction. So that's essentially what a solar cell is. That's the main step in making a solar cell. And then we put layers on top of the solar cell uh, to give it better electrical properties. And we also put metal contacts on the solar cells so that we can get the current out of the solar cell. So how does the uh, phosphorus layer on top of the silicon um, trap the light in the solar cell? What the phosphorus layer does is to create a PN junction. So that's essentially like a membrane inside the solar cell. So when the, the light is actually absorbed by the solar cell, the PN junction means the electrons can only go one way inside the solar cell so that they can create an electrical current. So uh, using this machine we can evaporate thin layers of silver onto the surface of the solar cell. Uh, so the silver goes inside the vacuum chamber and a high current is applied and that evaporates silver onto the surface of the solar cell. And how does the uh, silver form the nanoparticles on the top of the cell? After we have a thin layer of silver on the solar cell, then we put it into an oven and then it forms into little balls on the surface of the solar cell. How does it form the balls on the Just surface? Just by surface tension as the, as the silver is heated up. That's fascinating. So that was Dr Kylie Catchpole from the Australian National University's Centre for Sustainable Energy Systems, talking about her career as a researcher into more efficient solar cell technologies.